I've been struggling. I guess you could say to form an opinion in my head. Recently I've come across the... Well, it wasn't the essay itself, but other people's interpolation of the, of the essay. Their opinion of it, their understanding of it. And it's basically uh, somewhere along the lines of the uh, the basic laws of human stupidity uh, by Carlo M. Coppola. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Probably not. Now, other people I have read and watched um, their YouTube videos seem to struggle in a similar way that I do. That there's something about the essay that rings true, but something else that doesn't seem quite right. And I, well, first of all, the 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 essay is written in a very kind of lighthearted, tongue-in-cheek, don't take me so seriously kind of approach. But it's a pretty serious subject. Let's let's start off by. Um, by just reading the rules. Uh, so the first one is um, everyone will always underestimate the number of stupid people um, in society, in the world, in circulation. Just they will under they will underestimate how many stupid people exist. Um, the probability that someone this is the second rule. The probability that someone uh, is or will be stupid is independent of any other characteristic of that person. So um, they may be um, articulate, they may be knowledgeable, um, they may seem nice, any of those things. That's being stupid is divorced from their other characteristics. Three, a stupid person is a person who causes loss to another person or to a group of persons while um, himself or herself deriving no gain and may even uh, incur losses. So the opposite of a win-win scenario, sort of a lose-lose scenario. Uh, number four, Non-stupid people always estimate the damaging power of stupid people. In particular, non-stupid people constantly forget that at all times and places and under any circumstances uh, to deal and or associate with stupid people always turns out to be a costly mistake. And then number five is a stupid person um, is the most dangerous person. Um, and then he uh, later goes on to suggest that a stupid person is even more dam dangerous than a, than a pillager or a bandit. Now that comes from this Pascal sort of wager um, grid that he's, that he's created. So on, on one side um, he has uh, so on the, on the upper part of the, of the grid, there is um, intelligent people. Um, well, it doesn't matter what the x, y axis is. So on one side you have intelligent people, on the other side you have stupid people, um, and then you have the altruistic on top and the egotistical on, on the bottom. Now I'm giving the, the, the altruistic uh, egotistical labels here. He originally called it... Um, um, a benefit analysis, whether or not somebody benefits from somebody. So, but I'm changing that to altruism versus egotism, egotism because I think this what's at the heart of this analysis. So you have, let's let's take the let's take the the, the upper right quadrant. Okay, you have intelligent people who are also um, altruistic. These people will strive to have win-win um, associations. So they will want 
to something that benefits themselves, but they also want something to benefit society. Um, an example of that would be if um, if you owned a business or something, um, you would very fairly price your your objects, your 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 wares. You want a little bit but not so much as to gouge your customer. Um, the next type, so they would be intelligent but egotistical, would be what he calls bandits, and I would just call con men. These are people who attempt... Um, not attempt, but these are people who seem to think that the only type of transaction that is legitimate or even possible um, is win-lose scenarios. So if somebody else gains something from an interaction with you, you always lose. And if you gain an interaction from somebody else, they will always lose. The reason that I call these people con men is because that's really how con men operate. They attempt to harvest as much as they can from something. But they always try to minimize their own um, their own um, uh, risk. So the best con men are never caught. They're, the, the best con men play out their con for um, many, many years, many decades. Um, you wouldn't even think it's a con. But he calls them bandits, so like they, you could add um, um, thieves and all kinds of other things to this thing. Personally, I would just call them CEOs. That's that's that category. Very, you just any CEO you can think of, they would fit in that category. Then you have the altruistic but unintelligent people. Those would be the the the, the hapless. The helpful, but easily taken advantage of. He calls them helpless. Um, these people, um, they, they want to do good, they try to do good, but are easily taken advantage of. They're usually the victims of the bandits. Um, and you see them all over the place. The, the people who are willing to give you the shirt off their own back and, and things like that. Usually they they fall prey to um, um, religion and the, the religions tend to uh, um, tend to soak them for as much as possible. Uh, let's see what's here. What's in here? Then you have the fourth and come on, let me out. Oh, I think I'm. Oh, I keep thinking it's the mouse button, but it's not. Then you have the, the fourth category. Okay, these are the stupid people, the bandits, the ones that are dangerous. And they're the people who are not smart enough to have a win-win scenario or a win-lose scenario. They seem like they're the types of people who, in a situation where they would call for uh, some level of expertise or some level of cunning they don't have what it takes and would normally end up being the uh, the helpless individual but because they're egotistical they um, they don't allow that situation to happen or if they're on guard for that or any number of of, uh, of scenarios so they try to make it um, they try to make the other side lose more um, they they sabotage the situation so it gets even worse for that um, that other person and I think that this explains quite a bit about our, our society and why it seems like for every kind of uh, situation or category, you why can't I zoom in? You tend to have um, individuals. You tend to have about um, 
a quarter of the population agreeing with some kind of stance that somebody takes. Um, whether it be a, a, a political party, an, ide an ideology, um, a philosophy, y y it really seems like you tend to have about 25% believing that kind of stuff, believing conspiracy theories, believing in ghosts or, or um, because they fit, or, or believing in some kind of religion because it, it, it triggers it, or it triggers is probably the wrong word. It it fits in to the the ideology of one of those four groups. So a person that's you know um, is part of a religion may uh, see themselves as a good person, and that society's job is to help one another and be giving and uh, feed the needy, and not think of uh, of getting anything in return. Now, of course, the leadership of these religions is most definitely in the bandit category, but oh, I already have one. But the uh, but the the flock, uh, and it's probably not um, a coincidence that they are called the flock. Um, they it, there's a need within within the group for them to be the. Um, for the for the helpless ones, and for them, uh, mostly not to be helpless um, in a group. So, oops, didn't want to drink that. So, while in the group, strength comes from numbers. Kind of deal. The intelligent win-win people, you know, they tend to be you know scientists and things like that philosophers, people who try to make a contribution to society to better it. Some people might put politicians in that category, but uh, I think that that, um, that that category is um, very open to mis misuse, to uh, bandits infiltrating it. Any, any, why can't I get rid of that grass? Oh well. Um, anything where there's a where there's um, some kind of authority given to somebody else, there's the and there's the. Uh, oh, this is the first time I've seen a. Oh, that's a bucket. Uh, where trust can be traded for um, money or favors or sex. You will have people in there uh, attempting to um, monetize on that. Is that a pellet done? Or do I have one of those? And I think uh, that's why you see that in religion. But you wouldn't see in that kind of a situation like politicians until recently didn't really have a flock. They kind of just existed and, and attempted to make uh, make a living off of the gains from that uh, um, from that vocation. Excuse me. Now it seems like it's a career. Now it seems like there's. A strategy where you start falling into one to one of the two bottom categories. Is that the exact same weapon? That's the exact same weapon. I'm just trying to collect one of everything here. Like I said, I'm I'm not completely. I haven't completely formed. Uh, a picture in my mind of what this is trying to say or how relevant it is to um, modern humanity. I think that it is, though. I think that even if he meant it completely as a joke, even if none of it was supposed to be serious, um, I think he was probably hitting on 
some kind of subconscious realization of, of, of how the interactions in society work and how they um, how people categorize themselves like it is very common that in, in TV and movies and things like that you'll very often have um, three main characters of some sort, or at least one of two different types of characters of some sort, that um, exhibit this kind of this kind of, of uh, characterizations. You'll you'll have the the smart one of the group, the dumb one of the group, the um, the the sneaky, um, always trying to um, get a uh, always trying to, to run a scheme or something and you'll have like the 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 person who's like always falling into some kind of success or something like that. And we see those motifs in ancient writing as well, so it would stand to reason that it's that has been understood throughout the ages, let's say. But whether or not the wh whether or not it has validity or not, whether or not it's it's um, it's an observable law, an observable rule, like gravity is. It's a fact that we are mostly products of our genes and our upbringing. It's... there's there's no... it, it would be unsupported to say that um, we would get our personality or our um, prefer... oh, here comes the, uh, the, uh, the spaceship. This is the second time I saw the spaceship. Power's gone out. Turn that off. Ooh, spaceship. Oh, the alien's glowing. <laughs> Alien squid. There we go. So how... Our personalities, our core personalities, are very much defined in the womb. You can you can see um, fetuses start to exhibit some matter of personality, some some kind of disposition, um, and then when we are born, those those develop even further. And at some point, the, the the frontal lobe takes over, and then we start building a personality on top of our core personality. And that is an, an inescapable part of our biology. We have things that we react on an emotional level, on a, on a, on a gut instinct level that's, that is hard-coded into the lizard part of our brain. And there's variation in that, but not a huge amount of variation. And that would make sense, because we are products of, of our evolution. Um, if we were all hugely varied, then a lot of us would die to lions creeping around in a bush. Or... Um, having poisonous spiders as pets, or something weird. We tend to conform into categories because that's the easiest way to survive. And we haven't really been out of the jungle for very long to, you know, have completely overrided that, that, that biological progression. Is this another? Oh, this is a, this is a double place. I'm gonna, I'm gonna blow right past this. Because there's nothing here I want. Oh, there is a bus. Let's check to see if that bus has a better engine than this bus. Yes. I think I think I've got a very good engine on, in this bus, but I'm I'm not a hundred percent certain. Okay, 
Okay. Oops. I don't really like the keys in this game. No, no, this has got nothing. There's no tires. Is there headlights? No headlights. There's nothing in here. What was that? Oh. Nothing. And while this, while, while the, this, uh, this person who wrote the essay, uh, as I said before, describes it with types of um, interactions, the benefits of the interactions, I think it has much, to, much more to do with, with how selfless and selfish you are. Altruism versus um, egotism. Because those two things would seem to have a, um, a biological advantage. If you are altruistic, then you are more likely to keep your people alive. You are more likely to keep your tribe going. Um, and if you're egotistical, you're more likely to pass on your own genes. Um, Can those two things exist in the same person? Can someone be altruistic and egotistical at the same time? I don't think so. I think they're diametrically opposed. And I think we see that in... This is the most I've ever said I think in, a, in, a, in anything. And I think that, that we see that... Um, in how those two types of people interact with one another. Egotists are obviously all about me, me, me. They, they want to maximize their own pleasure, maximize their own um, let's just say wealth. And it doesn't seem to matter who they hurt when they do that. Um, it doesn't even come across or they minimize it or they just don't think about it. Whereas altruistic people, they tend to give till it hurts most of the time. It's a super interesting thought on humanity, I think. If you are an unintelligent egotist, does that automatically make you malicious? If you're not smart enough to get what you want, and other people getting things that you don't have causes you discomfort, wouldn't it be natural for you to respond angrily, aggressively? forget who the famous artist is. He sort of looks like Ron Jeremy. I can picture him in my mind, but Descartes, maybe? I don't really remember what his name was, but one of his famous quotes was about uh, destroying a woman before she can destroy you, or uh, before another man can have her, and that would seem to be the height of egotism. And I think that's, that's very, it's very easy uh, to tell what kind of a person a man is by how they treat their woman, their, their significant other. And I think it's very easy to tell what kind of a woman someone is by how they treat their kids. Because I think in human in a human's mind, a human being's mind, that is the progression of ownership. Men feel that they 
own women and women feel that they own men not as a hard and fast rule and not as uh, not universally but I think women have elevated concern for their children over their spouses um, whereas men would have elevated concern over spouses by and large not even by and large just to some degree let's say so the thought that immediately comes to mind is Christy Alley in um, um, Look Who's Talking, where she says that uh, she gave birth to Mikey and pushed him out and uh, held him for... He grew in her for nine months. And she should be uh, uh, lord and ruler over that kid's life or something of that nature. And I, th I think a quote like that... It's from a movie, I know, but I think a quote like that sort of exemplifies the ideal behind it, behind what that kind of a person would think of their children that the child is property and it should obey them and, and do what they're told and not question anything and I I breathed life into you I brought life in, in, into your world you wouldn't exist without me you owe me everything Which is a kind of scary and disgusting um, thought. But you have that also with uh, many historical men. I have, I gave you a, 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 a lordship, I've done this for you. I gave you children, you know, that kind of thing. I, I'm, I should be, I am lord of your house, sort of, sort of deal. And I guess the altruism side of that would be I don't own my kids. My kids aren't my property. We are partners in this journey of this child growing up. And uh, I know more than them, so I have to be the one... I have to be the bigger person to, to lead them. I, I can't always be their friend. Sometimes I have to be the bad guy. I have to tell them no, I have to do stuff that they may not understand at the time. In relationships, it would be like a partnership. Then when you mix in intelligence or lack thereof, Two altruistic stupid people together would be, theoretically, lucky losers. Never getting a break, living in a, um, a run-down shack, 80 kids running around, never having a damn thing, but ridiculously happy because, because they have each other. Then the opposite to that, you'd have, you know, the... the the, the miserable, intelligent people who hate each other but won't leave the relationship for perhaps fear of being alone, somebody else won't accept them, or because they're getting something out of the relationship, like a, like a CEO and a gold digger kind of thing. The more that I think about it, the more that I explore it in my mind, the more examples I can come up with where this grid fits, where it works, where it, it describes and predicts how a person would respond in that situation. And yes, it's very binary, but are people really shades of gray? Like certainly, you can have people with differences of opinion. And someone might think that capital punishment is um, an acceptable thing. But if they're altruistic, 
Would it be terribly hard to dissuade them from the, uh, that idea? Would it be terribly, terribly hard to convince them that capital punishment is, is, is not the answer to anything and that all it does is, is harm society as, as a whole and doesn't actually deter crime? I would say yes, because it's happening constantly now. There are people changing their minds regarding capital punishment um, as they get older. People that um, were my grandmother's age, that are my grandmother's age, who have constantly changed their mind given new information, be exposed to new information. But somebody who is egotistical wouldn't be able to change their mind. It would be impossible for them to do so. Like the closeted gay preacher. If he can't express himself, then nobody can. And that means homosexuality is wrong. And he demonizes it. And he, and he shouts from the pulpit. Meanwhile, he's on the down low with somebody. I think stupid altruistic people could be convinced of anything because they're they're just happy losers and they um, mindlessly fall into something they could be if, if they see somebody as their altruistic leader such as God they can be convinced of the necessity of anything even if uh, murder is wrong well, you gotta kill Hitler because he's a bad guy, and I'm pretty sure the, the intelligent altruistic people would, would agree with that assessment that you have if you have a, a truly evil person that is going to attempt to dismantle all of society you have to fight against that person and the, the happy losers would naturally follow that but if they've identified somebody as as a leader, perhaps they could be convinced of something that's, you know, colloquially evil. But the unhappy losers, the 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 unintelligent um, egotists. I don't think they think that way. I don't think that they have... that it enters their mind at all to be... to even assess that kind of a situation. I think they think... if some... that people would be deserving, like... if you murdered somebody, you yourself would be... Um, should be murdered. I think you hear the phrase from them, unforgivable, a lot. But does, does that mean forgiveness isn't something that they can, they can learn or, or think about? Like, does forgiveness even exist in their minds? If someone were to steal from them, to take something from them, would they ever be satisfied with any kind of punishment or any kind of recrimination? Or would nothing be too good for them? That there's just... There's, there's no way to pay that debt because they've already lost and losing is the ultimate sin for these people. It would definitely account for some individuals and their behaviors. I remember a number of years ago I was, I was friends with this person and I was trying to explain to them a rich kid's 
um, mindset. So he sort of offhandedly dismissed the notion that rich people or rich kids would be breaking um, tablets and phones and, and stuff for no reason. That they just buy them to break them. And I, I tried to equate it to him by asking what would he do if tomorrow everything he owned was worth a hundred times less. If he found out his, his phone was um, one one hundredth of what he paid for it. And, um, if his clothes were one one hundredth of what he paid for it. Just examples like that. And his... He seemed to instantly understand the mindset. He, he, he basically said... He didn't basically say... He outright said that, that he would destroy them too. He would destroy his stuff as well. And that's a very egotistical mindset. So say you are... Um, a rich kid. And you're... And you're family buys you a new iPad every year, the newest one that came out. And rather than give your old one to charity or a friend, a, a less advantaged friend, you break it because if it's of no value to you, then it's of no value to anybody and uh, nobody else can have it. Like, it's, it's not even a matter of... Okay, let's pause here for a sec. That it's not even a matter of, if I can't have it, nobody can. It's It, it seems to boil down to, of... If I don't like it, nobody else can like it. It's... Coveting your own things. I've never understood the mindset. Well, first, okay, so where do I think I fit in? I think I'm a happy loser. That's what I think. I, I have I have questioned my own intelligence for as long as I can remember. I was, I was a sickeningly stupid kid. I believed everything everybody told me. I didn't question anything. I was just happy and ready to do anything anybody asked of me. Unless it was boring. I didn't like boring stuff. But I, I think I, I firmly fit into that category. Sometimes I seem knowledgeable. Sometimes I seem articulate. But I think it's very much training a monkey to play the violin kind of thing. And that I'm just, I'm just a, a, a dummy who has learned how to how to remember stuff. I have a good memory. I have an excellent memory. I am gifted with a good memory. And I see other people all the time that don't have as good as memory as I do. At school, I have, uh, my entire life, I have never once studied for a test. Ever. Never. Never once for anything. From writing my driving exam, to writing my math exam, to math exams in school, English. Um, I, I, if I had a book report, I would read the book once, and I wouldn't underline or highlight anything or, or or take things out. I would just write stuff back down from memory. Excellent memory. And I know that other people don't have as good as memory as, as I do, but do I have intelligence? I still don't think so. The only thing that makes me think maybe I do have intelligence, but I think is probably disconnected from intelligence, is that I can solve uh, visual puzzles very easily. I can solve uh, mechanical puzzles very easily. You know, like, get this washer off of this piece of string, or um, untie this knot without taking the string off of these two popsicle sticks open this box, this puzzle box. That kind of stuff... I can solve. I don't know how easy it is, but like I can, I can solve them. Whereas other people I know can't, but... 
I have difficulty figuring things out. I get, I get frustrated with things that I don't understand, and they stick in my mind and just just eat at the back of my brain. I'm tenacious, most definitely, but does that equate to intelligence? I don't think so. I would also say that I'm probably not intelligent due to the fact that I'm I'm almost constantly taken advantage of. I've never had a good relationship. I have always been the other person's mommy doing everything for them. Um, working, cleaning, did they just sit there and look pretty, basically? So I think I firmly fit into that category. And I can understand the bandits. I can understand the intelligent people who want to take advantage of other people and leech off of them for their own existence. But I don't understand these destructive people. Uh-oh. Honey! No! There we go. Um... I'm entirely certain that my father is one of those people. And I'm pretty certain that my mother is one of those types of people. My mother and father both have appeared to be intelligent from time to time. But I think they're faking it. I think they care a lot about what other people think, and they can't really hold ideas in their head. So they use articulation and um, knowledge and memory to, to appear to be sophisticated and have well thought out ideas, but The moment they think they're on the losing end of something. The moment they believe they have lost. They turn into these monsters and just attack viciously at everything and anything. People, situations. My father will orchestrate some kind of plan to destroy somebody else. Whereas my mother is more of a uh, spur of the moment, self sabotage kind of um, wreck everything in the nearest vicinity kind of thing. When I was a kid, she very, very often um, threw things and broke furniture and just just went out of her way to to be horrible and destructive to, towards any anybody she thought that she was losing a fight to or or um, if she was if she thought that she was in the wrong or something and try and somebody else was trying to call her on it But I mean, is, are those really fair examples that I'm, 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 I'm using two, you know, psychologically disturbed individuals? Does this game have a light? Oh, wait a minute, I think I can, I can use a handheld light, right? There. It's perfect. Because they're not well individuals in, in any sense of the imagination, so maybe it's unfair that I'm using them as the archetype. Whoops. I guess that's good, right? Let's go. I don't want to fill it up too much because then I couldn't carry it. So I'm going to go for 40 liters and then that's it.
Not exactly sure. Maybe other people are struggling with this uh, with a question in the same way that they have they have people that they have in their mind that they they think is as an archetype of the situ of the of the of the of these categories of this these grid references, but then they think, well, those people are ill. Like that, you can't call a psychopathy. Um, a human trait. Like, suddenly, if these things are human traits, if, if people are... If 25% of people in the world will naturally be destructive, can you call that a psychopathy? Can you say that a person in that situation is... Oh, what just happened? in that situation is um, sick. If we evolve to have a certain number of those types of people, is that really a defect or is that part of the human race? Do we need them in some way? Do they contribute to society in some way? Like how, how do we how do we say that this, these class of people will bring down the world? And then how do we deal with them? If we are an altru if we, if we choose to be an altruistic society, how do you corral these people into not being destructive while at the same time um, not forcing them to forfeit their 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 humanity. Or, why can't I pick this up anymore? There we go. Or we forfeiting our own humanity. Let's say tomorrow the United States embraces this um, this theory that a quarter of people will be unreasonable buffoons and um, always try to make life miserable for everybody else. Would you then automatically have them forfeit their freedoms? Would you take away their um, their right to to vote? To um, collectively bargain? Like, and what do you do if the answer is no? The fact that people like that, e Jesus Christ, the fact that people like that exist is a huge problem. And if it is genetic, how do you deal with that without theoretically creating some kind of genocide to stupid people? Or is it already well known? Do do uh, politicians and the learned already know that this exists, and bandits are using them to their advantage to 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 put their thumb on the scale and in, in their uh, uh, in their favor? Are they using the the the, the happy losers to? Um, to tip the balance. And what would we do as a society to counter that? Because if it's true, no matter how much you ed educate the malicious, unintelligent egotists, egotists of the world, they will always be malicious egotists. And the only thing you can do to satiate them would be give them free shit. Make sure they're always happy. Ooh, feces. Just a moment. So in the video game, um,
rim world. The pawns that you use have traits. It doesn't super affect them. Doesn't affect really affect how they how they function. Any trait can be on any pawn, and you can get them to do basically anything, unless they're incapable of like some kind of work or or something of that nature. They will they will do something in your in your colony. But there's one particular trait called jealous. And pawns that exhibit the jealous trait hate it when other pawns have a nicer bedroom than they do. Now, they don't really do anything about it. It just negatively impacts their mood. But if anybody has a bedroom with a combined impressiveness score above their own, it's harder to keep them happy. And when they're unhappy, when, when any pawn is unhappy, they will throw a tantrum. They'll either wander around or um, gorge themselves on food or murder somebody. And their personality traits do affect what kind of tantrum that they will have. So is that the answer? We just make sure that these that these stupid, vicious people are always pampered? Is that how we make society run properly? That seems to be the answer that Star Trek hit upon. Star Trek, um, everybody has these, this great life, um, which is, which is blessed upon them by infinite energy and a matter replicator. And we're not too far away from that, that, that as soon as 3D printers start really coming off the shelves and people really start learning how to use them and, and start knowing that that anything they want, almost anything they want, the world can be spat out of one of these things in a couple hours or a couple days, depending on complexity. And eventually they'll, there will come a point where it will spit out complex electronics. Like, it won't spit out a top-of-the-line processor, but I'm pretty sure we're at the point where an 8088 can come out of one of those things. If we assume that they fit into these categories in roughly 20%, in, in roughly 25% uh, of the population, then, then that's really telling. Well, we have 50% of the population who's intelligent and 50% who are unintelligent with very little gray in the middle. It kind of goes, you know, it's very binary. It's either clustered on one side or clustered on the other side. And that seems to fit with my personal experience. Either people are clustered on the intelligent side or really clustered on the dumb side. And then you have altruistic versus ego. They're either clustered on the art, really on the art, uh, the uh, altruistic side, or clustered on the ego egotistical. And again, that seems like it's the case. People aren't really in the middle. So how do you plan for a society like that? The unintelligent, egotistical people can't be reached. We have to put them out of the equation. We have to stop thinking about them. The dumb altruists will do whatever seems best for everyone. The intelligent altruists will, of course, be the ones coming up with the best ideas. What do the bandits do? Well, if they don't look too far in the future and they only think about themselves right now, what they do is global warming. They destroy society and take it apart and, and use the, um, the other categories of people to um, further their own goals. I don't think I want anything here. Nah, there's nothing there. Does that ever stop? Like, at some point, do these people get scared enough to stop being destructive? 
the dumb egotists I don't think will ever give up. I've seen, like, if you've ever seen Homer's Enemy, I think it's called, and uh, Grimes, Grimes decides that he really hates Homer. By the way, that was that 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 was written by um, a conservative, somebody who thought that the Homers of the world was destroying the um, the world, and he refused to do interviews. He was really paranoid. At least that's what the other writers say. They could be they could be pulling a great big joke and just saying that to be funny, but I don't know. Maybe it's true. But Grimes is is the perfect example of, of this these these people who because he couldn't have what Homer had you know a beautiful wife kids beautiful house I guess he has a reasonably high paying job at the at the nuclear uh, plant that he goes on a destructive rampage and kills himself like of course that portrayal was allegory but if what the writers were saying about the person who broke that story was true if they were telling the truth that they weren't trying to put the audience on then I think Grimes was him. That it was an it was a an extreme version of himself that he thought maybe was funny. But I don't remember Grimes being funny. I don't remember that episode being funny. It wasn't a bad episode. It was a great episode, but it seemed more sad than anything else. It seemed more like a, a warning than anything else. And maybe that's why so many intellectuals refuse to believe it. The biggest thing that I see on YouTube, or what they, they lovingly, quote-unquote lovingly, call bread tube nowadays, is the pseudo-intellectuals sitting there proclaiming people are intelligent. If you explain things to them calmly and carefully, don't talk down to them, don't belittle them, they will understand. We've had 40 years of explaining global warming to people. It seems rather self-evident nowadays, and yet there is still a, a large proportion of people, about 25%. but still firmly believe that it's a conspiracy. And they're egged on by bandits who make money off of their ignorance. At some point you have to give up. At some point you have to... You have to address the fact that you are not going to convince them. Now, I say this about COVID. Not that it's not a harmless um, virus. But that we're at, we're at the point now that we have to give up. The 25%, the 20 plus, 25 plus percent that have been hanging on to the cuffs of the world's pants. Like, just imagine that in your head, that these people grabbed hold of the planet's ankles, preventing them from moving forward and keeping them stagnated. Those people have caused all the problems we see. Because if we all, as a society, went into two or three weeks of lockdown 
and kept the hell away from each other and followed all the rules super strictly, we would have killed it. I knew we weren't going to because we, that would never have occurred. And that's sort of a, that's, that's really a dress rehearsal for global warming or the next pandemic. That the people who deny it continue to deny it and don't care. I have known people personally, again, anecdotal bullshit, but I have stopped talking to certain individuals because now they're at, at a point where they want to change the course of history. They were sort of keeping quiet until this point. They, they were still saying some bullshitty things. But now they're at the point where they want what they want. They're utterly willing to lie. It's, it's no longer a matter of choice or anything. It's, it's, it has now become a conspiracy for them. They, hold, they held out super long. But their stupidity shone through like a supernova. And again, anecdotal evidence, but those people absolutely showed signs that they were not all there from the very beginning. They showed signs of the whole list of things that the 25% would have. Blaming scapegoats. Um, hating the out-group. People who aren't in your in-group. Straw menning, all of that kind of stuff. Even climate denialists. Not a hundred percent because we still bully people who are climate denialists. We don't bully too many people no more, but we we bully people who are climate denialists and who pollute and things. That's not a good thing. So they kind of held back on their on showing their full full hand of stupid on those on those issues. And I guess now, when they're at the forefront of feeling like they're losing, they're ready to lash out. What is that? Oh, that's the... I thought that was a... I thought that was a, a monument over or something over there. I was about to get excited. They're now ready to threat, to, 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 to lash out and bring the rest of society down with them. And how do you deal with that unreasonableness? When somebody says... The science doesn't say that... When you can show... Without question... That's what the science says. It is... A matter of fact... That wearing masks... Stop the spread of disease. That washing your hands... Stops the spread of disease. That's why you wash your hands when you're cooking. That's why the person doing your, your, your open heart surgery wears a mask. That's why your doctor wears gloves when he's injecting your face with Botox. Because even though Botox is a form of botulism, the grime he's got under, your, under his fingernails is far more dangerous to you. And yet they'll sit there, well, the science doesn't say that. Random testing might be, you know, something to be questioned. Because it's random. It might give you a sense of what's occurring, but it's not really going to save anybody. It's an after-the-fact kind of thing. Blanket testing, testing everybody, absolutely everybody who comes through a gateway of any kind, a major street, an airport, a, a, 
a bus terminal, a sea, um, uh, a seaport. That kind of screening will give you uh, enough data to do a lot with. But what do you do with somebody who denies gravity exists? Like, I'm not saying those people exist, but... What do you do if somebody says that gravity doesn't exist? That it's God's will keeping us glued to the planet? Or that we're, we're uh, uh, standing on top of a disc, on top of a turtle? Uh-oh. Uh-oh, SpaghettiO. Well, I guess I'm stopping here, because I just twitched out for some reason. That rock probably caught, caught the trailer back there. At no point in human history have more people known less about more. I don't know, well, I sort of know how a cell phone works, but I don't really know how it works. I know its components, I can, I can describe its function, but... Could I build one? Nah. Do I know what radio waves are? Yeah. Do I know how it encodes voice? Yeah. Could I, could I build a code myself? Nah. Ooh, that... I can't lift that, uh... Okay. I know how, um, a reactor works, but I couldn't build that either. I know how a light bulb works. I couldn't build a light bulb. Well, I might be able to build a light bulb. That's pretty simple technology. And all it really is is a, is a filament and uh, a vacuum. And you give me the proper stuff to play with, I think I might be able to get it. But... I don't even know what the point of saying that was. Oh yeah, because we are at a we're at a stage now where it's not only commonplace but expected for you to be ignorant, for a person to be ignorant. Well, that's what it looks like when I when I equip it. And if you're somebody who's angered by your own ignorance and by other people's intelligence then how do you live with yourself how do you live with the with the hundreds of people um in the society what do you do when the person convinces themselves that they do know how something works because they can't live in a world where they don't know how how it functions or if them not knowing how something functions means that it's it's dismissible i'm i'm afraid of nuclear power i'm not afraid of nuclear power but this is me talking for somebody i'm afraid of nuclear power so um we can't have nuclear power plants that's happening right now. People who don't know how nuclear power plants works are making decisions on them. And you might say, well, the people who do know how it works don't seem to be making very good decisions on them either. Uh, I would, I would argue that you know the people of that uh, were running TEPCO, the the. Uh, the, the Tokyo Power uh, Corporation didn't really know how the reactor worked. Um, 
Oops. And there's there's a quite a bit of evidence that uh, they were they were running their reactors wrong and causing problems. And I mean, Chernobyl. Yeah, they knew that they knew how to operate their power plant, but they also didn't know about a flaw. So it still seems like it's it was lack of lack of understanding that made it dangerous. And that's really what we're seeing here is there's is a lack of understanding makes these people dangerous. If they don't understand human nature and are, you know, making assumptions based on their worldview, or if they don't understand how chemicals uh, propagate in the atmosphere, or, you know, a million other complex things, and we ask them to vote on... Um, policies that would that would affect those those kinds of industries where we tell somebody that global warming is caused by this that or the other thing um, will you vote to you know um, limit the amount of this particular pollutant gets released into the atmosphere? Well, if you don't know how it works, and you have somebody who's, you know, telling you that it's it's not real, and you have reason to um, believe that it's not real, because your job um, uh, relies on you not understanding, or your friend's job relies on you not understanding... Whose opinion are you going to take when you can't understand the under underlying principles? Well, evolutionarily speaking, it's best for you to rely on the side of caution, which is keeping your job and keeping your friend's job, keeping the mine open, because if the mine closes, you won't have money, they won't have money, that's an immediate thing. When you have somebody that you don't particularly know or particularly trust telling you, well, your grandkids are going to be fucked if you keep doing this. Well, that's our grandkids. Even if it's real, somebody will fix it some down, some way down the line. And these people are being asked to make decisions on the future. And you have the intelligent altruist and the intelligent egotist vying for their attention constantly personally I think the problem we're having contemplating these kind of questions is that there's no answer Are you going to hope for an altruistic, tyrannical leader who's going to respond quickly to the problems and fix everything? Is that why people are following, following Musk? Because he seems like the egotist that will get things done? Because certainly government won't. Government is looking at the exact same issues and they have the exact same people in it that are, you know, trying to understand or not understand. Government really does represent us. If you look at somebody slimy and how they act, well, there are slimy people just like him out there in society, and he's representing their interests. You look at an altruist like Bernie Sanders. He is representative of the people. The intelligent um, altruist. So 
I don't think coexistence is possible. Like, you might call it tribalization. The media loves to call it tribalism, but... <coughs> I thought that I would... that would go under. Oh, and there's my light. Oh, look. That's, that was fun. Because democracy is functioning. You might want to think that it's not, but if if fifty if over fifty percent of the population wants the other fifty percent to be miserable, that's democracy. It's it's majority rule. That's what democracy means. It means everybody has a say, and then when there's um, a, con a a simple consensus, or a simple majority you act upon that information. Neither side likes it. Democracy is not a good thing. It's the only thing we have at this point. At, at this very... At this very moment, it's the only thing... It's not the only thing, but it's the best functioning thing that we have anarchy we wouldn't be able to organize properly there would there would just be the bandits tyranny is too easy to be infiltrated by again a bandit a bandit trying to um, extract the maximum uh, amount of positivity for themselves while taking advantage of others I have no answer. And I think I like this game because I'm going on a journey in the game and I'm kind of going on a journey in my thoughts trying to figure this out. And I won't figure it out until I read or watch somebody who has a, a better opinion than I do, has, has more intelligent than I do, and I, I read it and I think that makes sense. Because I am the lucky loser. I can't come up with something on my own. It just leads to more questions. Unfortunately, at this point, I think the answer is we give up. Because in every category, we're doing nothing. We're getting nowhere. And the consensus is, is that we can't just override the stupid people. Our cultural zeitgeist is that they have just as much right to their opinion as we do. And the cultural zeitgeist is even the possibility of being wrong is enough to question something. And we are crippled. And I think that's the answer for the foreseeable future until some mega crisis comes along, even bigger than COVID, because COVID was essentially nothing in the grand scheme of things. Only, it, ha it had a, a mortality rate of way less than 4%. I think it's less than 1% now. They have to go through the real numbers to figure it out. But, it's not smallpox. Smallpox killed a third of people that got infected. Just imagine if it was smallpox that got out again, that was transferring from one person to the other, and one out of three people you knew died and another one out of three people walked around with with horrific, vicious scars on their face and body for the rest of their lives. We didn't get that. We got the the sanitized version. We got the 
Mother Nature taking a ruler and whacking us on the hand saying, I'm going to get you next time. And there will be a next time. It may be in our lifetimes. It may be tomorrow. Might be in another hundred years. But the next smallpox is not an unforeseen eventuality. It might happen. An asteroid could hit us. A lot of things. And I don't think we change until that happens. Because we never did. We never have. We have never come together as a people and motivated ourselves into something spectacularly positive until we are looking at dying as a people. Until we're facing our own extinction, either on a planetary scale or as a group of individuals. And I think that's it. I think that's where we're at. It's not an answer. It's not a reply. It's not a solution. It's reality. The reality of us as a human race, as a planet, we're disabled and unable right now to save ourselves. Bereft of self res rescue. Until we are gasping, desperate for the next breath, that we claw our way back to something. Not until so many people are dying that it's it's unignorable and that it it, it hits everybody randomly. A true Thanos snap where the person next to you could drop dead and you could be next and that will motivate us to do something but when it's your grandfather or your friend's grandfather when it's your great grandkids that's, that's too far away it's too distant for us to react you have to be exceptionally sensitive and exceptionally altruistic to be able to respond to that and I think only a, a fraction of that that one intelligent altruistic quadrant is that. So I guess that's my verdict on this journey. However long we've traveled. I think we traveled a hundred kilometers today. We traveled a hundred kilometers in a game, going nowhere, sitting at a desk in front of a keyboard, watching um, computer-generated scenery go by, algorithmically uh, derived scenery. I'm missing the word that I'm looking for. Procedurally generated landscape. And I'm still in this room. Our society is still in the place that it was an hour ago. A year ago, a decade ago, four decades ago, Ukraine is in the is in the news once again. I remember being a small child in Ukraine, being in the news, and Russia being the aggressor. So little has changed that my image of a crippled society in my head. us kneecapping ourselves and just crawling along at the, on the ground but it's fine because we've got plenty of food and water around us right now it would be positive to say 
we're so dead. Because then we might respond, but we're not so dead. We're just so in a rut as a people, as a society. We're in a rut, spinning our wheels. Some of us behind the wheel, sitting, saying, if we just think about this logically, and people in the back, jumping up and down like monkeys, saying, we're not stuck, we're moving forward. Can't you hear the engine? 